A warm welcome back to our program this evening. As promised, we're going to the first of uh, two segments of a frank uh, discussion. The first, let me start, of course, from uh, the studio here, where we're being joined uh, by Pastor Itua Igodalo. Pastor Igodalo is, of course, very well known. Uh, senior uh, Pastor Matters. Trinity House, of course. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Thank you for, for, for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. In our Abuja studios, we have Professor Ernest Ojuku, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. Professor Ojuku, thank you for your time. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, we, we'll just we'll, we'll start the discussion from taking a look back at our recruitment process of leadership. Uh, because when people talk about leaders, it's usually from a pipeline. So let me start with you, Pastor Godalo. You have spent a great deal of time with young people trying to become leaders. Uh, what have you found to be some of the perhaps missing links in the process that requires people like you to come in? Uh, what has really been a bit of a deficit in Nigeria is a lack of national ethos, a lack of national feeling, a lack of national culture. If you go to most countries of the world, you would find that there is a dominant culture, there is a dominant ethos. If you go to Germany, you find the Germans efficient, timely, strong machines, America, capitalists, but very, very disciplined people who try to work to some rule. British, they have their own ethos, and so on and so forth. But in Nigeria, we have not been able to wield together a national ethos and a set of principles under which we bring up our children. So we have a very laissez-faire uh, environment where anybody just picks up their child and brings them up in a certain way, and the survival instinct is overwhelming. People just want to survive, and they do anything to survive and to earn a living. So in my part of the country, Edo State, you would even allow your daughter to go to Europe and do prostitution so that she can bring money back home. Uh, some people send their children to go and be a driver, go and be a mechanic, go and herd food, go and do anything, just bring money back home. And when you do things like that, there's no basis on which you can uh, moralize or tell the child what is right or what is wrong. Even these days, they encourage children, go and cheat in the exam. Just cheat, just pass, just get it. And today, nobody believes that if you don't know somebody, you cannot get anything done. As a pastor, I get requests every day. I want a job, I want a job, I want a job, I want a job. Who do you know? They arrest you at the police po uh, post. Uh, pastor, they've arrested me. Please, listen. if you don't know somebody, that's it. So you don't know the law, you don't know the principle, you don't know the rule of law, you don't know what your, 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 your rights are as a citizen. Anything can happen to you in Nigeria. So we're in a bit of a jungle, unfortunately. And until we get that thought from the top right, driving down to the very bottom, will continue to just, everybody will do as they want. They said in the Bible, there was a time when Israel had no king and everybody did whatever they wanted. That's what we are in Nigeria. Okay. And it's tough to put it together. Speaking of the thoughts from the top, as you've put it, you heard the president's address today. He, he did talk about youth inclusion in government. Let me just start by asking you what you made of his address, listening to that as one who works with young people. Um, did you feel 61 years after um, it's something that gave you hope or courage? Well, in fairness to the president, this is probably the longest speech he's ever had. And I think this one has been well written uh, and sort of well documented. But there's nothing new. Uh, we've been on this path since 1960. Presidents say the same thing. There's no energy. There's no drive. There's nothing to convince me listening that these things are going to happen. It's, it's another conversation. I do hope that some of those things would happen. But uh, talking about youth inclusion, yes. I mean, well, starting off, Nigeria was run by youth, to be, to be honest, since 1966. Uh, Gawand was 32 or 31. He was, he was a bachelor when he became head of state. Uh, Iransi was 42 or 45, and so on and so forth. Even Aula was about 50-something, and uh, Tsaba Falewa was about 49. So we've had largely a youth-minded uh, government. What we didn't have was informed, educated, 
energized, exposed, and focused visionary leadership. We've really, really not had that in Nigeria, and that is our problem. So I do hope that with time and with uh, the passage of democracy and with the strengthening of democracy, we will be able to get the cream at the top because a lot of the people who started in 6066, they've not left. It's the same names since I've been born. I've Buhari, the same name, Obasanjo, the same name, uh, Fajui, the same name, Adebayo, the same name, Gawan, the same name. Gawan became head of state when I was five years old. And they're still around and so on and so forth. So we've not really had any transition in leadership. And now that we seem to be beginning to transit, the culture is totally wrong. Not there. Mm -hmm. Let me go to uh, Buja Studios where Professor uh, Ernesto Juku is. Prof, one of the things that uh, happened uh, more recently, feeding off what Pastor Igodalo just talked about, is that there is a not too young to run act now. Uh, and uh, President Buhari is very proud of the fact that he signs that uh, into law, providing a legal framework for youth participation, for the participation of uh, young leaders in the contest for leadership. You're a lawyer, and I'm sure you've seen that bill, uh, that act. Does it provide some of the missing gaps that Pastor talked about and that others may have identified as well? And not at all. The, the law does not provide anything new. Uh, doesn't provide anything new at all. Uh, what, at best, what the law has done uh, is to bring to the fore the importance of addressing the issue of youth participation. Um, and I, I, actually, an attempt to energize our constitutional provisions relating to age participation in, in politics. But as a matter of fact, it, 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 it cannot solve the problem by legal instruments uh, in any way. Now, the, you, you mentioned the issue of, by the way, we invited uh, the Minister of uh, Youth and Sports to join us uh, in this discussion, uh, Mr. Sunday Dari, uh, but uh, he declined uh, to join this discussion. I, I'm, I'm just, I, I mentioned that because when you talk about the age not being the key point, Pastor Yodalo pointed out that a lot of our leaders were already young people, so it's not really about the age as well. But what I really was interested in was that, did you think that that provided a framework of some kind of leadership pipeline to provide for younger elements to, in an organized fashion, participate in the leadership process? That was the question. Yeah, it, it has an opportunity. It creates an opportunity. Uh, that an opportunity cannot be translated except action is taken behind the opportunity. It creates an opportunity uh, uh, which is now left for us to uh, 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 you know, fill up. Uh, by just having the law, uh, that opportunity will, not, will still not arise. Uh, look at the party, party politics, for example, the internal arrangements of parties. Um, that is one of the areas you look at to see whether uh, that law will help. Uh, if the, the system in each of the parties uh, still uh, shuts out uh, the youth uh, in, in, in practical forms, uh, no law, the law will still not help, be helpful at all. So it, it surely creates an opportunity. It's a good law. Um, it's a good policy statement. Uh, it's supposed to energize us to now begin to address the issues. So, but it requires uh, real action, practical action uh, um, uh, by actors, uh, especially the leaders. Because um, in, in this type of governance structure we have, no matter how much you demand of the followership, the leadership has a greater responsibility and obligation to recreate the system and make it work well. All right, th thank you. L let me now um, bring in from our Cairo studio, Professor Munzali Jibrin. Professor Jibrin, thank you for joining us on the show, and, and I'm sure that you've been um, listening to this conversation quite keenly. Um, before I ask you to, to comment on um, some of what we've heard today, just tell us what your view is of, of the country at 61, and then we'll delve into um, our thoughts on leadership. Professor Jibrin?
Okay, I, I, th I think he can't quite hear us. But let me come back to you, um, Pastor Igodalo. Uh, I, I know you've, you've talked about the fact that everything seems to be going the way it is, for, for want of a better way of putting it. Virtually every section of this country, every area claims to be marginalized in, in some way or the other. Um, some sections feel they haven't received justice. Um, what would you say, what would be your advice as one who everyone comes to, uh, the young people, old people, the elderly people, what should be the rhetoric? And I'm asking this question because when you hear others say, uh, we cannot continue this way, some people interpret that to mean you do not want us to stay together any longer. What would be your, your, your view? I think Nigeria is a great country. I tell anybody who bothers to listen to me that I think Nigeria is one of the greatest countries in the world in terms of the blessings, the natural blessings that it has. Strong people, a lot of people, strong resource, capacity and everything. What we really have not done is to have a very inclusive governance of our people. And it is the military interruption in our governance process that has really caused this thing, plus the British influence before they left us in 1960. They ran a roadmap for Nigeria. They planned Nigeria to end up the way it is for their own benefit. And they can quote me and they can challenge me. And there are records to show that this is what they planned, okay? And then the military boys came in and then interrupted this, okay? But I think what we need to do now, if we're honest to ourselves, is to sit around the table. Everybody has to sit around the table and we have to discuss and we have to converse. Why some people are afraid to make this happen, I don't know. But we have to sit around the table and everybody's opinion has to be heard and everybody's conversation has to be taken into consideration. Okay, Professor Jibril, let me come back to you now. Uh, apologies for that earlier. Um, Mr. Godola has said we all need to sit around the table. Another table, what would be your, your assessment? Sorry, could you repeat the question, please? Yes, yeah, so my question to you is we're looking at thoughts on leadership, um, looking at Nigeria at 61, leadership at all levels now. Um, if you were to look at the crystal ball, looking back and now looking forward, what would be your thoughts in terms of uh, how we should move forward? Should it be another sitting around the table again, or where have we got it wrong? Okay, well, um, I believe we've, we've had varied um, leadership styles within these 61 years, um, most of them not good enough for the country. And uh, moving forward, I believe we need vi visionary leadership, uh, transparent leadership, and purposeful leadership. Uh, because uh, very rarely have these qualities been combined in one leader and uh, a lot of deficiencies have manifested themselves uh, in uh, previous leaders uh, and I think but we we've been improving and we've been learning yes uh, so I believe that moving forward we're going to get better and better but, uh, yeah. Prof, so many people have talked about all the things you talked about, visionary leadership, committed, looking forward, and all of that. But it's one thing to say it is another thing. You or yourself just admitted that uh, it appears as if those qualities, we haven't quite gotten them in one leader yet. And that's 60 years down the line. Is it the recruitment process that is wrong or that is deficient or, what is, or is it the fact that our country is too complicated or too big to produce that kind of leaders, given the kind of process that we throw up any time we want such leaders? Um, I think we've, we've had very good leaders uh, at some stages, but sometimes they didn't last long enough. Um, I believe that uh, General Mutala Mohammed, who was uh, a military leader, um, uh, encompassed some of the qualities that we would love to have in a Nigerian leader. Uh, unfortunately, of course, the system did not tolerate him, so he was cut down in his prime uh, after only six months. Um, 
that we've had good leaders, but they didn't have all the qualities uh, that, that we mentioned combined in them. Um, but you see, the leadership deficiency is also complemented by followership deficiency. Uh, because I think we, as a people, we have been too subservient to our leaders, too unwilling to hold them to account, and uh, too psychophantic. So um, I believe that the, the, the electorate, the, 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 the citizens, ought to rise and demand a certain level of um, service and leadership from their leaders, and it is only that that will guarantee that we have uh, improved leadership in future. Uh, it won't come on its own, because even in the advanced polities and economies, um, it is because there is so much demand for accountability uh, that uh, leaders can't get away with, with non-performance. If you look at our, not, we're only looking at the presidency, but look, look below the presidency. Look at uh, the states, for example. Look at local governments. Um, a, a lot of the governors grew up during the military era, and, and their, their uh, conception of leadership is that which says, uh, I will take decisions in great secrecy with minimum consultation, and I will order implementation immediately. And anybody who opposes me is marked as an enemy and will be dealt with as such. And this is wrong. This is a democratic regime. If, I don't want to mention any names, but if you, if you look around, you will find this trait in many of our governors. They, they behave as if they are dictators or military commanders uh, who cannot be challenged. And, and, and also, you see, the, the Constitution provides for accountability of the governors to the state's houses of assembly. But what do we have? We have the governors pocketing the state houses of assembly, and, and uh, there is no opposition there, there is no demand for accountability. So as long as we have this, this arrangement, leaders will get away with, with, with murder, literally. Yes, yeah, so um, I think the followership has to take some of the responsibility for leadership failure as well. Okay, Professor Joko, let, let, me, let me quickly come to you now. I mean, we've been looking at um, leadership for the last 61 years. Uh, well, a lot of lawyers that I've spoken to have said that the next two years are critical and there should be some sort of impactful, multi-stakeholder government, uh, you know, coming from all sectors of the economy to satisfy um, all the various groups that are agitating. In your view, Will this be the solution, now trying to look for an, a more inclusion at this time with two years to go to 2023? Just quickly now. Yeah, of course, uh, the more include uh, uh, divergent uh, sectors of uh, any population, the better for fairness, the principles of fairness and equity. But that does not, on its own, cure leadership deficiencies. Leadership deficiencies are quite different from implementing um, actions of state. Um, equi equity is where you address the implementation of actions of state. But you need to have leadership that can governize the system uh, to play that equity, play uh, uh, inclusiveness, and so on and so forth. So the, the, just changing that uh, uh, platform and including divergent views will not solve the problem in any way. I, I, I want to stay with you, Professor Juku, for a second uh, in order to yeah. ask you about the pipeline. I've been mentioning that pipeline uh, for, for quite a bit uh, in this conversation, which is how we produce these leaders. Because from everything that has been said so far by yourself, Professor Gibran and Pastor Egonalo here, we have talked about the fact that, yes, the leaders have been deficient in one way or the other. But in order to get one who isn't quite so deficient or, who, or those who are not quite so deficient, I've been told that you need a pipeline from which you can choose. How do you produce that pipeline? Uh, there's no potential for the pipeline in the country. There's no potential whatsoever. Uh, if you listen to the pastor, 
Um, there's no the, the, even though we have national core values, uh, which was enacted and signed into, uh, into a policy statement by President Buhari about a year or two ago, um, we have always had some value, cultural values from our communities, uh, uh, but there's a total breakdown of, uh, of values in the country. And so there's no way you can have a total breakdown of values and you, you will be, you'll be able to lay down any pipeline for leadership uh, policies that the professor just talked about. Uh, the system is not on its own the problem, even as weak as it is. It is the human beings that operate the system that is a problem. And th th the human beings must operate on, a, 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 on an acceptable value system. And our, the human beings here, uh, uh, called Nigerian, does not have that general moral value that uh, you can use to lay down, uh, lay down a pipeline that can produce the best quality. So we are going to depend on luck. Uh, to get the, uh, the quality leadership that the Professor talked about would be purely accidental. Mr. Godalo, let me come back to you, uh, Pastor Godalo, I beg your pardon. Let me come back to you about what Ladi is talking about, this pipeline. Um, anytime we, we talk about youth inclusiveness in government, it's not as if we're going to, going to pluck somebody and put them there. With about 10 million um, children out of school, and those who even make it to school, you find in some areas, security crisis will not allow them to even stay in there. What, what do you think should be, um, beyond, beyond the lip service of youth inclusiveness, inclusiveness, what do you think should be the solution to getting the right people into that pipeline and moving them all the way up? Well, until you have a leader that thinks above the fray and thinks nationally and thinks the way you are talking about having a pipeline, you will not have that pipeline, okay? Because what happened in Nigeria is that a lot of people who should be in the pipe were discouraged or discourage themselves or didn't get into that pipe. And therefore, the pipe now is a bit locked out and they are out of the pipe and you cannot create that pipeline. Anywhere else in the world, it would have created itself naturally. Ironically, one of the leaders in this country who created a pipeline is Bola Tinubu because you can see that Lagos has told a story from Bola Tinubu to Fashola to Ambode, now to Sonwolu, a gentle pipeline. And after Sonwolu, I can tell you that there's three, four, five people who are positioned to go through that pipeline. But there are some that will not be happy with that, the pipeline arrangement that you're speaking about now, even though you, you, you've, you've said it is positive. It is a pipeline. It's a definite pipeline. Uh, Bola Tinubu, you can say anything you want about him. He looked for leaders, and he didn't need to know them. He didn't know Shibadu before he made him attorney general. He looked for them. And he tried to, at least in some areas, find some form of competence. We have not done that at the national level. Mm -hmm. National level, we've just thought about sharing cake. Where you come from, you share your cake, you share your cake, you share your cake, you go away. Nobody. Nigeria is an orphan. Nobody's thinking of Nigeria at this point in time. Let uh, me stop you there and ask this. Yeah. At what The thing you just said, you said nobody's thinking Nigeria. Nobody. The flip side of that question is, don't we have to define who a Nigerian is for us to be able? There are people who say that the way that you, you have Britons and Americans and so on, you don't have Nigerians like that. Yes, because nobody at the top who had the responsibility of defining for us what Nigeria should be ever did it. Okay? Before Awolowo and Saudana and Zeke had time to sit down and define Nigeria, they were thrown out of the scene completely, okay? They came in as tribal warlords, sound ra sat around the table, and they didn't have a time enough to define. And when the military boys came, they didn't even think about it. They just took up a responsibility, a war came after, and they fought the war. The Gowan didn't even have time to settle down after the war to start to define. And I'm not even sure he thought exactly that way. And before Indi Mutala Mohammed came, then Obasanjo came, so handed over to Shagari, Shagari Buhari came, threw Shagari out. We've not had time to sit and think as a nation. And we have not been fortunate enough to have somebody at the helm of affairs that was really prepared for leadership. A lot of them were accidental leaders went through no training, went through no tutorship, went through no education or learning, went, they were not even tested. You know, Gowan was a, was a Lutheran colonel. He had not <laughs> really led anything before. How is he going to lead 150 million people? 
uh, in all due respect to him. And he turned out to be one of the better or the best ones that we had, and so on and so forth. How does somebody move from being a supervisor and assistant in an, an office and suddenly becomes the managing director? It doesn't happen anywhere in the world. There's a process of training. You know, Sheikh Mwagwaji is just retired as MD of uh, Guarantee Trust. He started as a banking officer. He went through training 25 years, became MD, and handed over to somebody. That is the natural process of training. But here in Nigeria, you don't have any such process. People are plucked out of different places, put into the thing, and then they become something. They're not thinking, they're not reasoning, they're not planning, they have no vision, they don't care. They've been sent there, bring the resource to our family, or bring it to our tribe, and they obey it to the letter. And they don't care what happens to Nigeria, and everybody tends to think that Nigeria will solve its own problem by itself. Until we begin a search and we speak to us. I was speaking to some people in my home before I left. I said, the problem with Nigeria is that we're not ready. People are not ready. When you say, come out and do this, they say, ah, let me sort out my house, let me sort out my wife. We are not ready until people are really ready and they're pushed to the world. And they start asking questions that what is going on here? Nothing will happen. And then the people have kept a lot of people who should speak ignorant, unknowledgeable, dragging cattle all over the place. A Mark Zuckerberg potential is pulling cattle from Shokoto to Lagos. How is that going to happen? 10 million people out of school. How is it going to happen when you should have a government that's focusing on educating the people, enlightening them, bringing them out of poverty, upskilling them, and making sure that they can run their own businesses and contribute to national ethos, they don't care. And this is where we are, where we are. And until Nigerians, we all rise up, you know. There is a, there is a picture that I saw. When the people rise up, the game is up. Until people rise up and people like myself are able to speak to people, educate them, change their thinking, transform their minds, it's just going to continue like this. Because the level of ignorance is abysmal. And as long as that is in action, nothing is going to happen. The first thing Lee Kuan Yew did was to educate his people. But we don't even care about education. We, we say education is not important. How are you going to survive in 2021 without education? Talk to me. Pastor Godala. No, 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 no. If we leave Pastor, <laughs> if we leave Pastor Godala. Talk to me. I was, I was, I was, I was worried. I was about to say, let us go back to Professor, Professor Jibrin, because he's, he's now talking about education and, and yes. ignorance and how that can actually put, put, put the people but down. Then, with yeah. the leadership question. Yeah, so with the leadership question, um, Professor Jibrin, um, what's, your, what's your take on it? Look, let me even go back to July, where there was the Global Economic Summit, uh, the Global Education Summit, I beg your pardon, the president was there, and all countries there were making their pledges for education. Uh, some would say 20%, some would say 10%, for instance. And then you have uh, the percentage of, of our budget, less than 6% um, budgeted towards education. Um, is that the look of, of, of a nation that needs to take education as seriously as it should, Prof? Let, let me just start with you. Professor Jibrin, go ahead. Okay, I don't think he can hear us any longer. Okay, let me come back to you, Professor Ojuku. Uh, the question I had put to Professor Jibrin was on education and, uh, and, and the percentage, etc. But what I'll put to you, being, being a lawyer, Mr. Godalo was talking about us being ready as a people. Is the judiciary ready in terms of its leadership to take Nigeria where it ought to go? Um, looking at the, at the structure and judicial reforms, which is mostly talked about over the years, what's your take before we go back to Professor Jibrin? Uh, okay, yeah, sure. The, the judiciary is uh, another sector of the system, and it cannot be better than the rest of the system unless the system is, is good enough. Uh, the judiciary has tried over, over the past few uh, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years to uh, uh, elevate itself to um, some best practices, including reforms in access to justice. Uh, but there's one major part of it that has not been tackled properly, and that is in the appointment of the personnel. 
a greater problem emanating from the judiciary is from the personnel, is from the level of personnel. Uh, 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 the, 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 there's a problem with, the, with the appointment of personnel, which has um, dented uh, the, the spirit of uh, independence of the judiciary. Um, the appointment of judges uh, is still uh, I, I, I mostly secret. Um, uh, the, the, the public has not been uh, 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 allowed to uh, have a voice, uh, the system has not been allowed to uh, have a voice in the caliber of, of personnel that is recruited. So I'm sorry still to interrupt. You. I'm in sorry to interrupt you, so Professor I, Juku. I, I, I think you. Yeah. I, I think perhaps you got Ijoma's question a bit wrong. Uh, uh, Ijoma right. was talking about education uh, and the fact that. For us to build a pipeline of leaders, Pastor Godalo has pointed out that need, they need to be educated. But with us devoting only 6%, as opposed to other countries that devote 20, 22% uh, to, or even more than that in some cases, to education, uh, we might have a bit of a problem. The judiciary that you were talking about just a second ago would also uh, be affected by that. But... More broadly speaking, in terms of general education, we have 10 plus million children, mostly, of course, in northern Nigeria, out of school, although that number may be more now with what is happening in other parts of the country. But the fact remains that we don't seem to be putting enough in education. Is there a link, do you think, between that and our inability, if indeed there is an inability, to produce this uh, leadership pipeline? Of course, uh, the, there's, a, there's a great link between uh, education and leadership and governance. It's a strong link. Uh, we have you know, a, a strong popula po population of educated pers persons in the country. But uh, also the quality of education matters. Uh, uh, the orientation you, the, the, the population uh, has been exposed to is important. The culture uh, and the values. So no matter how much educated you are, uh, if you still don't have those values that are based on honesty, sincerity, decency, and so on and so forth, no matter how much educated you, you are, you, you, you still have a problem with leadership. The, uh, you, can, you, can, you can acquire all the education in the world and still will not be able to lead a population. And we have seen it in many cases. Where there are too many educated governors in the country. There are too many educated House of Assembly members. There are too many educated senators. There are too many educated House of Rep members. But that doesn't change the quality of leadership. Uh, education is important for leadership, but leadership on its own uh, is not based on just going to school. And so they, they, it will help, but it does, they, as long as you have lost the value, the the, the, the community values that you need for governance, no matter how, uh, how, how many educated we have in the system, it still not matter. We have examples from uh, unions. Uh, there's, uh, there's leadership problem among uh, uh, university law teachers. There's crisis in the Nigerian Labor Congress. There's crisis in Nigerian Medical uh, Association. There's crisis in uh, elections or, or at the Nigerian Bar Station. All these people are all the educated, very, very educated. But there's still a problem in the leadership, uh, in the pipeline thing, in, uh, in all those professional associations. So uh, it, the, just the leadership, the education on, on its own does not account for good governance in any way, in, in, the, in the form we're talking about. Okay, Professor Jibril, let me, let me come to you now. Apologies again, um, you couldn't hear us earlier, uh, but I believe you did um, hear the question that, that I put to you um, about, about education and, and just what you feel about, about its state and where we are right now, um, 61 years later. If you can hear me, Professor Jibril. Fantastic. So, could um, you? Yeah. yeah. Well, yes. um, I've, I, I've followed the discussion. It is true that um, we have educated people at all the levels of leadership, but there is still poor leadership. Uh, you know, you have, we have cases of professors who have been ch chief executives of parastatals uh, being caught um, red-handed, red uh, engaging in all the malpractices and uh, corruption that 
that other people who are less educated have been caught uh, committing. So, uh, so I, I don't, I don't think that um, the level of education has any correlation with uh, leadership. I believe that um, the way we recruit our leaders and the total lack of accountability in the system are responsible for poor leadership. Um, education is good, but it has to be part of a package. Uh, in, 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 in some jurisdictions, uh, morality and uh, service orientation are inculcated in the citizens through the educational system. But children are very per perceptive. If you teach them something and the society does something else, they see the difference and they see the contradiction and therefore they will not uh, implement what you teach them in school. So in Nigeria, if you teach a Nigerian child to be honest, and he finds that even his teacher is not honest, his, his parents are not honest with one another or, or with the children, and gradually he finds out that the society runs, runs on dishonesty, there's no way you can expect him to, to, uh, to be honest. So, so uh, education has to be part of a package. That is to say, you teach them good morals uh, and you practice good morals outside the school. And more importantly, you, you put in place sanctions to make sure that anybody who misbehaves is promptly dealt with by the system. Uh, but one of the reasons why there is so much poor leadership is, as I mentioned before, lack of accountability and also the possibility that you will get away with, with anything. So people, people commit all sorts of crimes or uh, 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 allow themselves to, to fail as leaders because there are no consequences. So, you see, you can't blame the educational system and putting more money in it will not solve the problem. Yes, I know we need more money in education, but, but for this particular problem, it's not a question of money. So, what is yes. it? Pastor, thank you. What Pastor, is Pastor Godalo, you're shaking your head vigorously. It's not a question of money. What do you think? Uh, how do you educate people? It costs money to build a classroom. Even if you are going to educate them with a phone and a tablet, you have to spend money. You have to pay a teacher. You have to develop a curriculum. You have to put in money in education. So the narrative that um, we should move from funding education to investing in education is something that you agree with, not just throwing money at it, but actually building the institutions that will make it thrive. It's critical. You have to invest in education. If you do everything that a child knows, a child learned either through education or through instruction or through information or through looking and observing, everything is education. It's not from our classroom alone that's education. But we have to invest in education. We have to make sure, first of all, that everybody is knowledgeable and they know their rights and they can challenge something that is not going according to what they think. If you're not educated, how are you going to challenge anything? You can't challenge anything. If you're an area boy, you don't know what your rights are because you haven't been to school, you can't challenge anything. I am on this platform because I'm educated. So is professor. I, you should have gone to the village and picked up anybody and put them on this platform because you want to hear my ideas because I've been exposed, okay? What we had in Nigeria are leaders that were simply not exposed. They were not themselves educated appropriately, and therefore they couldn't pass the education down the line to others. I am here because my mother was educated, my father was educated, and they educated me, and they sent me to schools that gave me certain values, okay? If you don't send people to schools that give them values and educate them, 
How are they going to speak? How are they going to reason? But Pastor Gadalo, let me ask you, when COVID-19 hit, Nigeria was praised for its handling. The, the leadership was praised for coming together through the ranks, the local governments, states, federal, and really fought that pandemic to what we have, where we are today. And lots of people said, if we could do that for COVID, why can't this trickle down to other sectors of the economy? Is this the still, still the same set of leaders that achieved that. So can you really say what so, you're saying? So tell me who was responsible for the COVID initiative? Which one you tell me. Responsible? Well, you tell me. <laughs> the people who were responsible for the COVID initiative were competent people. They were competent people in that particular area. The gentleman who ended the NCDC is a competent person. The guy who headed COVID in Lagos State, Professor Akiyan Bayomi, was my senior in primary school, secondary school. He's a competent person, okay? They knew what to do. Jide Idris that handled Ebola in Lagos State six or seven years ago is a competent person. We were fortunate at this time to have a set of competent people who were there. Mind you, in some states, they didn't handle this thing well. I know what Godwin Obaseki did in Edo State to capture COVID. He's a competent person. But there's some states today who still think that there's no COVID in Nigeria. Think about it. But we're lucky, fortunate, that at the federal and critical states like Lagos State, they were competent people. Abayomi didn't sleep for almost three months all over the place, running here and there, supported by a competent or a capable and exposed governor. But the other places, some people are still walking up and down. And even then, we haven't handled COVID well. You go around the streets, even in Lagos, in the market, nobody is masking up. We're just fortunate. Why you hear COVID has gone. We're that was just fortunate was. in Nigeria. Yeah. I don't know what Nigeria did or Africa did. We're fortunate. It's not even a measure of our competence. Because how many testing did we do? How many vaccines have we done? How many masks? How many people are walking everywhere? They don't even believe that there's COVID. Go to any market in Nigeria today. You will not find, if they put it under the chin, and there will be, it's one out of ten under the chin. <laughs> We're just fortunate. If, if, if that so, many. I will not even say that it was even our real competence that saved us from. And then again, we don't even know how many people died. At that time, in Kano, people were dying almost every week. But the, well, the argument that, there was, was that there was a glimmer of hope somewhere that the leaders could come together and for achieve that, that for that purpose. Maybe, and that that's the argument. Come together maybe, for a lot of maybe, exactly. maybe crisis. We came together and fought a civil war and came out of it. How many countries have done that? Maybe Nigerians can react to crisis. Maybe there's something in us that makes us able to react to crisis. But a lot of the time, we don't plan ahead. We don't look into the future. We're crisis managers. We're not people who look ahead. And I'm glad that at least COVID, we could come together. <laughs> Professor Ojuku, would you say that we are crisis managers? Yeah, that... I, I was going to ask him that. You have, you have about a minute. We have, to go, we, have, we, we have to go to another studio, take another discussion briefly. But Professor Ojuku, are we crisis managers? Are we very good crisis managers? Surely not. Uh, we're just lucky people. We're just lucky <laughs> not, people. Not, not good uh, crisis uh, managers. Not, just lucky crisis good crisis managers. managers. Okay. Uh, they, they, you mo we must explain the difference between uh, having a leader that's educated, very well educated, and having a leader that's competent. They're not, they're not the same thing. We must also explain the importance of educating everybody, almost everybody, to support good governance. But that does not provide good governance that you have educated everybody. They must be, we must uh, pigeonhole the discussion to be able to understand exactly uh, where, we, where our weaknesses are from. Uh, the fact that you have educated everybody, which is important, to stop, for example, uh, this crisis in security, the crisis in managing your lives, does not mean that you will have a good leader that can help you galvanize all that uh, ability to uh, forge ahead as a country, civilized country. So we need competence, but the process does not allow any competence. The people who vote for us don't allow any competence uh, because there's a cultural problem. It's a value problem. The and until we get a leader who will now take it upon himself to begin that reorientation. We can't get it from the bottom. It must be from the top. 
The choice is ours. Uh, surely we can't manage any crisis well. We just get lucky. As the pastor said, uh, when I read about the prison of Nigeria with the management of COVID, I was laughing because I'm a COVID ambassador here, and I know that uh, we didn't manage anything at all. We're just lucky that um, we're not dying. Okay, Prof. I know that argument can go, can go on. A lot of people would, would, would see it a little bit differently. But don't go away. I know you still have a lot of thoughts to, to share with us. Same for Professor Jibrin and as well for you, Pastor Godalo. Thank you so far. But you're going to stay with us. Now, we can't talk about young people in their absence. So we do have um, it's a teeming young people. Um, we're going to listen to their views and voices. For that, we'll turn it over to our political correspondent, Shim Okimbaloye. He sat down with them. Let's hear their voices. Let's hear their views on Nigeria at 61. And then we'll come back here on the other side and continue this discussion. Please stay with us. Welcome back to our continuing coverage on Nigeria's 61st independence anniversary. What a conversation that we had just before that break with, with the young people there, um, as well as our political correspondent, Shim Okimbaloye. We looked at them talking about politics, about participation, and um, interesting there that they ended on the note that the young people should take over the political parties. I'll hand that last thought over to our panel, which we had before we went on the break. Um, our, the senior pastor, Trinity House. Pastor Ito Igodalo here with us in Lagos. We also have had earlier on in the day the Pro-Chancellor, Federal University, Lafia, Professor Gunzali Jibren in our Kano studio. And also in Abuja, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Professor Ernest Ojuku. So, Prof, I'm going to come to you directly now for your, for your reactions to that um, very vibrant conversation Sheung had with the young people who are into politics at the moment. Prof. <laughs> okay, good. In Abuja, I said, yes. Professor Juku, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> I was wondering. Yeah, sure. Uh, very, very exciting uh, conversation they had on uh, the youth empowerment in leadership in Nigeria. Uh, but the first thing I will say is that the, the young people in Nigeria are victims of our convoluted uh, culture of corruption. And uh, so whatever uh, we aspire for them cannot uh, uh, materialize until we also address that our position which we have used to infiltrate their ranks and uh, dethrone them very effectively from aspiring to leadership. Uh, they, they expressed the, the fears about participation, which involves a lot of money. And I heard some of the, of the participants say that money uh, is involved, but it's not a major problem. Now, surely, if money is not a major problem, if money, uh, 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 the money that is an issue is not just the money to campaign, if that was a problem, uh, youths will still get the money to campaign because uh, people invest in them, like one of the members said, if they have social values. Now, but the problem is that the money that is an issue is the money of corruption, the money to rig the election, the money to hijack the ballot papers, the money to use um, uh, 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 talks uh, on election day, uh, the, the money to thwart the, uh, the, the, the honest choices of people at primary elections. Uh, the, there's no party that runs a democratic, honest primary. So the, the young people are very, 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 very victimized in all senses. And so I, I applaud those of them that have the courage to step into, the, into, the, into that tide. But it is going to be very difficult for them. Mm. Okay, P Professor Jibrin, uh, let me have your, your response as well. You see one of the participants there saying that she tried to come and help and she was asked, what's in your war chest? You haven't yet landed. You know, with, with, with talk like that, how... Is that encouraging? And, and what did you feel when you heard her say that? Yeah, well, um, it is true that um, m our type of uh, democracy requires a lot of money. Uh, if people want to contest for office and they have fresh ideas, if they are not backed by a godfather or some money bags that will bankroll their campaign, they are not likely to succeed because the, the, the two major parties have become, have become so entrenched that they are operating like closed shops. Uh, you can't get in 
except if you are if you are introduced by a, a ranking member and if if they also know that you have radical ideas then you are not you are not likely to be welcomed uh, if you go to the smaller parties of course uh, the voters don't don't normally want to waste their votes so they don't look at those parties so i think the 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 lady who was talking about um, having a war chest or not having landed i think these these are quite uh, uh reflective of of what happens uh, in in our society regarding democracy so uh, 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 we need we need radical reforms to make sure that um, there is independent candidature for example and also uh, that we minimize the role of money especially the, the, the money that political parties charge uh, to, 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 to accept um, candidates for the primaries uh, also here the influence of the governors has to be uh, curtailed because because a lot of the governors simply give instructions to the delegates for the primaries to say it's candidate A or candidate B and every, and everybody votes that way uh, uh, we can't have i mean it, this is democracy without democrats so i think we need to do a lot uh, a lot of uh, uh, reforms in order to make it a real democracy I said, yes. I don't know. Minimize money. Can we, can we do that, really? There was an attempt to do that uh, in the last election by INEC, and we don't quite know how that ended in terms of putting a cap on spending really quickly. Now, it, it did come up in, in Sharon's conversation with the youth there how important money seems to be in our politics. In any political dispensation, money is important. In fairness, even if you have a normal uh, campaign, to go from street to street costs you money, to print papers cost you money to convince people to vote for you will cost you one kind of money or the other what we're trying to eradicate is a high level of spending fueled by corruption that encourages corrupt practices is where the real challenge is but i'll go back again to the foundation my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge when you have no information you don't know who you are you don't know what your rights are you don't know what to do. Small money can make you do crazy things. Small money can make you do crazy things. If everybody had a certain level of understanding, nobody can come and teach you nonsense and tell you rubbish. You will put them in their place and tell the man that you are talking absolute rubbish. But when a man brings a bag of money, you've been hungry all day, you are not exposed, you don't know what to do, you better accept his money, do what he asks you to do, and go your way. This is exactly what's happening in Nigeria today. And the issue now is, what can the individual or the average person in Nigeria do? Because a lot of time we, we, we talk a lot of theory. They should do this, they should do this, they should do that. They will not do it. Because they know what to do, but they will not do it. It's not in their interest to do it. Why would they do it? When, as the status quo is, they're making all the money. So we, as the ordinary citizen, you, myself, and this, we must do something. We must begin to talk. Each one of us must begin to talk. Each one of us must find somebody down the line to educate and to inform and to tell them that they have rights and to tell them to stop being afraid and to tell them that these people are not magicians. They're ordinary people like you and myself. We must Pastor, begin to uh, talk. Uh, uh, we've completely run out of time. Uh, uh, I, w I, w I want to thank you uh, very much. Uh, in fact, I want to thank all our guests uh, on this segment, starting, of course, from you, Pastor Itwai Godalo in our Lagos studios. Thank you for your time. Uh, very well spent this evening. Uh, from our Abuja studios, uh, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Professor, uh, Professor Ernest Ojuku, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And from our Kanu studios, Professor Monzalit Jibril, thank you very much uh, for your time, uh, for joining us uh, on this segment uh, today.
Now, it's not only Nigerians uh, or Nigerians who are here in Nigeria who are concerned about Nigeria uh, at independence, where it is today, 61 years later. Nigerians who live outside the country are equally concerned. And Ijoma spoke to some of them about their aspirations, what they feel about the country, even as it turns 61.